All right, welcome to my session on building a managed database service using Kubernetes operators. Um, before getting into the weeds, I want to start off explaining who I am and why you should listen to me. So uh, my name is Jimmy Zielinski. I'm the founder of a company called AuthSed. At AuthSed, we build a database called SpiceDB. And what SpiceDB does is it stores your authorization data. So when you build a permission system for your applications, um, Eventually, you hit a couple different types of problems. Maybe you want to make dynamic changes to the system without changing um, code in various places, or maybe you have multiple applications that need to share the same data in order to determine an access decision in your code. Um, and that's, that's the type of scenario in which you would reach out for uh, an authorization-specific database. Um, <clears throat> so my background is in product engineering and operations. So I've worked as a product manager in the past. Uh, I've worked as a software engineer building uh, distributed system projects. And then I've also worked in operations running those distributed uh, systems in production. Um, <clears throat> so despite my background being in product, I still write code every day and carry a page over the services that I build. Um, prior to founding Osset, I worked at a company called CoreOS, um, which got acquired by Red Hat. Um, and at CoreOS, I actually co-created um, a CNCF project called the Operator Framework um, uh, alongside some other members, uh, now members of the LSED team. And uh, what the Operator Framework lets folks do is um, basically more easily build uh, operators so they can customize Kubernetes and extend it um, in ways that make sense for running their, their domains. Um, <clears throat> so as a part of CoreOS, I was also a maintainer of OCI, which is the container specification, um, and I've done a bunch of work in the container registry space um, over the years. So uh, that's a bit about my background. Um, all right, um, to level set the for the talk, um, before anything, I always like to kind of um, level the playing field, make sure that everyone is using or understands the same uh, terminology or what we're talking about um, before diving right in. Um, so uh, to be able to even discuss this topic, we have to kind of cover two um, major um, subjects, right? The first is what's a managed database service, and the second is what are Kubernetes operators. Um, so a managed database service is going to be uh, pretty much uh, you outsourcing the operational side of a database to a particular provider. So instead of you spinning up a database and managing it on top of your own hardware or even cloud hardware, um, this is going to be uh, someone else doing that for you and purely giving you the details you need for your application to connect to that database. Um, and then um, you're basically out of, the, uh, out of the way for that. So you don't have to maintain a pager or anything like that um, to make sure that the database is operational and able to serve traffic. Um, there's kind of two different types of providers that you can outsource to. There are cloud providers um, that obviously have the expertise in running software on top of the cloud environments. So examples of that would be Amazon RDS um, and uh, Google Cloud Platform's Cloud SQL. Um, these providers offer the typical relational databases, uh, but they also have individual services for more specialized databases. Uh, the other type of uh, expert that you can outsource this to are the actual database providers themselves. So folks like Cockroach Labs uh, selling CockroachDB uh, dedicated and um, my own company, LZ, selling SpiceDB dedicated. But there are plenty of other database providers in the space that also do similar. Um, Elasticsearch and Redis also come to mind as kind of examples of these database uh, provider uh, experts that offer these types of services. All right, uh, so then what are Kubernetes operators? So operators are custom controllers for Kubernetes that encode application-specific logic. Uh, so that basically means uh, extending the Kubernetes API and teaching it about uh, effectively new concepts that are specific to your domain. Uh, the uh, point to all of this is to basically effectively improve how Kubernetes is able to handle running that application. Uh, but uh, even more greater concept is actually uh, encoding your domain into Kubernetes so that 
uh, the Kubernetes control plane actually becomes the central interface for everything. Uh, it's, it becomes the source of truth and you can always use uh, the standard tools like your, your dashboard or kube control to query that and understand what is running in production. All right, so without further ado, um, I'm going to talk about my anecdotal experience building SpiceDB dedicated. Uh, the reason why I'm going to use this uh, is not only familiarity, but also because we've uh, actually built this service semi-recently. There are a lot of other um, managed database services that are probably built on top of Kubernetes, but because of the recency of this, uh, I think it's probably more applicable to someone looking to build a similar service uh, today if they're trying to do that for uh, building their own product or just building a platform uh, engineering team internally at their business. Um, so uh, the rest of the talk is going to be basically me describing the system we've built, kind of like this, the decision-making process we went through and uh, kind of the way we've kind of divided things up and how we think about um, the different problems that we had to solve. So at a 10,000 foot view, um, we can kind of break down this problem into three major phases, um, provisioning, runtime, and then the day two operations. Uh, the provisioning side is going to be kind of how we create the customer environments. Um, so that means everything related to creating and updating clusters and what lives on those clusters. Um, and the finer details to that is actually how you decide to split up and differentiate between what is what defines the cluster and what defines the configuration that lives on top of the cluster. This is actually pretty subtle. Um, when you're trying to uh, understand what things should uh, need to be updated with the lifecycle of Kubernetes itself versus things that can be iterated on with changes to the application. Um, so that, that's one of the subtle aspects. Another uh, big one is how you're going to promote changes to these different customer environments. Um, how are you going to roll out Kubernetes updates uh, or any changes to um, the aforementioned cluster uh, configuration? And how are you going to do that in a way that um, can be progressive and so that your customers, if, whether they have maintenance windows or they're very sensitive to updates, uh, can get the updates at the regular cadence that they're expecting. Um, then we move on to the runtime phase. The runtime phase is about uh, basically what things have to be running uh, live when customers are using these systems. Um, this is where uh, the managed database as a service kind of differentiates from a lot of other workloads that you might be running on Kubernetes uh, because the customers are actually going to be modifying the, the, the cluster itself in real time. And uh, that basically means that we need to be able to not only manage our own configuration, but also be able to respond to end users uh, deciding they want to take operations like scaling their database cluster up or down. Um, the other unique uh, kind of problem in this space is going to be handling the availability and performance requirements of running a database. Uh, databases are typically very performance and latency sensitive workloads, and they're also stateful workloads. So all these things kind of complicate uh, the actual production uh, runtime of, of the system. And uh, basically being able to run a service in a way where uh, when different events like uh, scaling up or scaling down happens or you lose a node in Kubernetes, uh, to be able to handle that in such a way that you don't lose any performance or drop any requests um, is very tricky and something that uh, every database as a service is going to need to manage um, because you can't necessarily make uh, changes in the application code that is talking to your database. Instead, you need to make the, the actual runtime uh, as robust as possible because you don't have any control of the application code uh, connecting to the databases you're managing. Finally, we have the day two operations, which are basically the, the actual operations that our SREs are going to be managing. Um, so this has to do with basically handling backups. Um, specifically, uh, as I said, customers can modify these environments. So that means we not only have to be able to reproduce our clusters, but also be able to reproduce the state that the customers changed. Um, and then we also have to power our own operational workload. Uh, so that means we need to be able to uh, aggregate metrics across customers. We need to understand the health and state of the customers, page our engineers and things like that when something is going wrong 
on a customer environment. <clears throat> So I'm gonna dive deeper into provisioning now. Um, I'm gonna list out some of the technologies and some of the core concepts that we've chosen to go with. Um, I would say a lot of these different technologies are personal choice. I'm not saying that you should choose one over the other, um, but I'm going to include why we ended up with the ones that we have. Um, but these reasons are kind of organization specific. And if you have a company, for example, that has a ton of Terraform expertise, go ahead, use Terraform. Um, I think that's a, going to be a better choice for you if, uh, if that's what you have the expertise in at your company. But um, for us, for example, um, we picked Pulumi. Um, we're very comfortable writing Go code and we actually wanted to build ultimately one binary that is kind of our infra um, program that can manage all kinds of different things. So uh, Pulumi just gets embedded into that process. So we actually have commands for provisioning things, but we have other commands for, for accessing different systems um, that would be a part of our operations team, uh, basically everyday work. So uh, that's why we ended up picking Pulumi. Um, <clears throat> for actually reconciling uh, configuration on a cluster, we use Argo CD. Um, Flux is another example of a CNCF project uh, that also kind of does this uh, continuous deployment. Um, we ultimately landed on Argo specifically because it has a nice web UI for checking the health of all the environments, but also it has kind of um, nice uh, functionality for actually applying the changes like dry runs and pruning. And um, you can actually write Lua to, to kind of extend Argo um, in some scenarios where um, we, specifically for when you're creating operators, um, you're going to create custom kind of uh, definitions of healthiness in the status fields and Argo can be extended with Lua to actually understand those to know um, whether a, a custom resource that you've actually created for your operator is healthy or not. Um, so that's super useful functionality there. Um, for the actual configuration we use on the cluster itself, uh, we use Customize. Um, we previously used Q a lot, um, but we ultimately migrated to Customize because it was really easy to structure, um, integrates directly with kubectl, um, so our engineers don't have to install any additional tooling. Um, it's way easier to onboard engineers because if you understand Kubernetes, you probably, uh, Kubernetes YAML at least manifests, you are going to understand using uh, customized to some degree. Um, and it lets us actually really reuse a lot of tools off the shelf um, because you can kind of point to any manifest in a Git repository and use that as a reference and kind of extend that using customize. So uh, as we adopt more and more of the kind of standard community tools, um, we can kind of just point customize to those tools and get them vendored uh, almost for free or with very little modification. Um, and yeah, if you're using Q, you kind of have to do all the legwork of kind of um, importing and uh, transpiling basically YAML into Q and you're kind of on your own for a lot of uh, a lot of the tooling and structure, um, but I imagine some of that will change over time. So uh, it's not necessarily cut and dry. If you're watching this video six months from now, maybe the the state of the world for Q has improved dramatically. So uh, finally, we also use GitHub Actions, and we use GitHub Actions uh, mostly because we can automate a bunch of the GitHub APIs for opening um, and merging pull requests. Uh, and that ties very much so into the concepts I want to talk about. Um, the high-level concepts that we have uh, are largely around kind of our promotion process, which we call the ring model. The ring model is um, specifically about uh, basically bucketing customers into groups of stability um, so that we can slowly roll out changes uh, one phase at a time to that bucket of customers. Um, so uh, for example, uh, what we actually do is we have a staging instance and the staging instance gets every change pushed to it as part of a continuous deployment. And then uh, when things look good, we uh, promote that to what we call ring zero and ring zero is other testing environments, um, whether it's doing performance testing or just staging environments at all said. Um, then what, uh, what happens is once that kind of passes the QA there, then we actually promote it to ring one, which would be our rapid kind of release uh, phase. So customers that have adopted into getting updates sooner, um, but potentially uh, less stable releases, um, and then kind of so on and so forth, we promote to ring two, which is more stable, and then ring three, which is more stable, uh, et cetera. 
Um, so that's kind of how we structure how we roll things out. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, inspired by the internal model used at GitHub. Um, we have some X hubbers uh, uh, said, and that, that actually inspired us greatly to, to solve this problem this way. Um, so we know it scales because it's being used by big companies uh, like Microsoft. So. And finally, we have uh, kind of GitOps, but GitOps by bots um, is kind of how I want to <laughs> talk about it. Because while GitOps is great, um, making changes in some of these repositories can be very verbose and error prone. It can take a really long time. So what we actually do is we have automations all around it. So you can manually uh, kind of click from a drop down to say, um, I want to promote this ring to this ring. Um, and then bots handle the rest. So you get kind of like the, the benefits of having everything checked into Git. And if you had to manually override anything, you could. Um, but also a lot of the error prone uh, side of copying and pasting specific versions into specific places all automated away. So in the general case, you pretty much don't have to open your editor to, to make the changes um, that you want to see uh, propagated to the system. Um, so here is a drawing of our customized configuration. Um, we kind of split it into three top level folders. Um, we have the bases, the features, and the overlays. If you're familiar with customized overlays are typically used for the um, kind of end results. Uh, that's going to be a renderable thing that um, you can actually apply to a cluster. So we have a dev one or actually variations of dev ones and then we have kind of customer specific ones the customer specific ones we keep um, in a separate repository the infra repository that tracks all the customer environments and um, the dev one lives in our mono repo alongside the configuration itself um, but then overlays are composed of uh, at least one or more base and then a set of features so um, examples of features are like Postgres database or um, ECR for getting your, your images on this cloud provider or GCR if you're using Google Cloud. Um, so we actually break everything down into these different uh, features that you can then compose together um, and uh, to actually build a working system. Uh, and then the bases are kind of like the base layout for a cluster um, that installs the things that we want to assume are always going to be there. Um, so in the, the actual like regular cluster base, we have um, basically the monitoring stack that we uh, want to use to deploy to absolutely every cluster to make sure we kind of have a, a baseline of understanding the health of every cluster um, that is not specific to any workload that we deploy to it. Um, this gets used both on a, an infra cluster that um, we run centralized for our infra like operations team, um, but also then on all the customers as well. Um, but then we also have this dev base, and this dev base is basically filling the gap between um, something like uh, Docker Desktop, Kubernetes, or Kind, and making that um, exactly similar to what we get when we run Pulumi to generate a cluster um, on a cloud provider for an actual production environment. So that kind of fills the gaps there so that um, uh, the clusters look exactly the same. They have the same starting base. Then we apply the base, and then we apply whatever features um, are specific to that that environment. Um, so here is kind of the architecture of the GitOps pipeline. Um, in our mono repo, as I said, we have a uh, configuration that lives in there that makes it so um, developers can iterate on configuration and also the code for the different projects and kind of spin that stack up locally and running on their machine um, and test everything out. And then when that looks good, that gets committed to the mono repo. And then what happens is we have this other info repo which tracks customer environments. Um, and the customer environments are actually uh, organized into rings. And then those rings reference a specific commit SHA um, of the mono repo um, so that you can actually point it to a particular snapshot of the configuration in the mono repo at a point in time. Um, so that's how we kind of get uh, basically all the version tracking and the ability for us to promote uh, different versions of the configuration to different customer environments. Um, inside of that infra repo, we also have um, the binary that manages Pulumi, and that's what's going to provision the individual clusters. Um, we have configuration files for each, um, each uh, customer environment in there as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the central 
central source of what is represented in production. Um, every cluster is also deployed into its own cloud provider account. So if you're running on Amazon, uh, each customer runs in an AWS account um, that's individual to that that particular customer. Um, that's just the level of isolation we've chosen for the system. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily a hard requirement for, for every managed database as a service. Um, we're just a security product, so we take um, kind of isolation a bit more seriously than a lot of other people. Um, so then finally, we have our centralized infra uh, Kubernetes cluster. This is what runs Argo. It runs Thanos um, so that we can actually collect metrics and, and query and understand the runtime of our customer environments. Um, but what Argo is going to be doing is it's going to be pulling the infra repo and asserting that each of the customer environments is synchronized to the proper state that the customer environment is configured for. Um, so this makes sure that if uh, there's anyone that logs into a machine and they are debugging something, if they uh, skew the configuration, it's going to be restored eventually by Argo. Um, that way, uh, even if a machine gets um, gets compromised, um, we kind of have something that's uh, going to reset the cluster um, and uh, basically make sure that nothing is nothing is the way it shouldn't be. Um, so that's our high level of uh, kind of the GitOps workflow that we have. Um, time to move on to the runtime environment. In the runtime, we have built two custom operators. So this is going to be the kind of the with Kubernetes operators portion of the talk, which is uh, kind of the meat and potatoes. Um, so we have decided to split uh, basically our system into two different operators. Um, the first operator is open source, and it is basically all of the configuration and operational know-how to automate running SpiceDB, the database itself. Um, we make those open source because we want our customers um, or any open source users to also be able to operationalize and run SpiceDB just as good as we can. Um, so this includes um, scaling SpiceDB, making sure that it doesn't drop traffic, making sure SpiceDB knows how to uh, basically self-cluster. Um, it handles um, running migrations if the data changes across versions. Um, it makes sure that uh, it has an update graph and make sure that you go from a supported version to a supported version and um, basically assures you that you have zero downtime as you go through the upgrade process. Um, so this kind of logic all lives inside the SpiceDB operator. Um, and then what we have is, is the AuthZ operator, which is our proprietary operator. Um, and this includes automations um, that largely uh, are reliant on assumptions about how we've laid out our clusters. So if the functionality um, is tightly coupled to opinions and decisions for how to run a Kubernetes cluster, um, then we keep it in the proprietary one. So uh, purely because it's not applicable to anyone else's deployment, um, it's only applicable to ours. Um, so that's kind of the decision-making framework for us on where we cut, cut things off on the open source and proprietary. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the users, they get this Next.js front end that we've built, um, and that's the, the customer facing interface, but it's actually an interface to Kubernetes. So what we're actually doing is making it so when a user logs into the, the dashboard for uh, Space to be dedicated, they're actually seeing a view of Kubernetes um, and the resources that live on the cluster. And when they say, for example, choose to create a new uh, SpiceDB cluster, they're actually um, talking to a JavaScript application that is going to uh, talk to the Kubernetes API and create custom resources. Um, and that is how the core of everything is functioning. Um, it's all using Kubernetes as the source of truth. Um, and then, of course, we kind of have all the additional tooling um, that compose our uh, kind of opinions for how to run Kubernetes. So that's using um, things like Contour and Cert Manager um, and like the Prometheus operator, uh, th things like these. Um, so at the core, the concepts of our runtime include um, basically centralizing everything into the Kubernetes control plane. You want to use that as your source of truth. Um, it makes it a convenient API um, for, for managing all these things. For us, our data 
like the actual control plane um, that's being used for our customers to make changes is one and the same with the control plane that um, our operations team is managing. Uh, so that gives us a convenient way to, to uh, basically interact with the system. We don't have to build some kind of admin interface into the dashboard so that we can kind of get our operations team access to the customer control plane. No, it's just one and the same control plane for us. Um, so that's where a lot of the benefits come from. Um, but also the, the power of the operators being that the customer-driven changes um, actually live also in the cluster. So this is what's enabling the fact that a customer can log in, start making changes to the infrastructure, and those can apply immediately because all those automations are not a living operator that has to get paged and go to the cluster and make a change to it. Instead, it is a Kubernetes operator that's running in the cluster that can manipulate the desired state of the deployment and just run with it. Um, so with that, uh, we have basically the namespace layout of one of our clusters. Um, some of these namespaces get applied to absolutely every cluster, and some of these namespaces are exclusive to a particular cluster. So um, the Austin monitoring namespace, for example, gets deployed to absolutely all clusters um, that we run. This includes kind of like the all the infrastructure we need for paging, alerting, um, uh, doing uh, metrics, uh, tracing the applications that are running on the on the cluster. Um, Base, and this goes all the way to non kind of spice DB customer clusters. This also runs, for example, in our infra cluster so that we can make sure that the infra cluster is running and healthy, um, even though the infra cluster is only running our internal tooling and not spice DB workloads. Um, so this is fully generic and can be reused uh, across the company, um, but then gets specialized by uh, kind of the resources that get created in other namespaces. Um, so then we have the um, OSED system and OSED region. So uh, the difference between these two are the system is what I would say is the customer facing control plane. So multiple um, uh, in region in uh, customer environments where they actually are running in multiple regions. So say you have a um, Europe and a North America uh, Kubernetes cluster deployment. So you have two individual clusters. Um, what ends up happening is you pick one as your control plane, and that's where um, the offset operator runs, that's where the dashboard runs. Um, anything that's kind of driving the information on the dashboard um, is going to live there, and what ends up happening is when you choose to provision something there, uh, the offset operator actually understands the configuration for the other regions that make up the customer environment, and it will create resources um, in the appropriate cluster. So OSED region is kind of the thing that standardizes, uh, standardizes a cluster to be able to run SpiceDB. So primarily it has the SpiceDB operator in it, um, and that's going to sit there and watch for the request to create clusters or make changes to clusters that the OSED operator is then going to create as a reaction to a customer making a change in a dashboard. Um, and it's going to create those clusters inside of the tenant namespace. So the tenant namespace is where all the kind of uh, runtime customer data is. Um, this is where uh, the systems they've provisioned live. Um, it's the one that the operations team is mostly going to be inspecting um, because these are, these are the places where the customers are actually live making changes. Um, this is uh, what we typically focus on for backing up uh, data, like customer-specific configuration, um, the things that they have actually changed on the system. Um, every other kind of like smaller namespace in here are the kind of cluster dependencies. So we use the Prometheus operator and kube state metrics um, just to like make sure that um, we're kind of got the, the standard, um, standard operational um, kind of deployment for uh, collecting metrics and observability from the cluster. Um, I kind of mentioned earlier that we use Cert Manager and Contour as our um, ingress and PKI infrastructure. And then uh, we actually create uh, two deployments of Contour um, in uh, the internal and external namespaces. These namespaces are for internal and external traffic. So because customer environments are often in um, VPCs, like virtual networks, um, 
that traffic goes through a specific load balancer, um, and then internet-facing traffic goes through the external load balancer. Um, so that's how we kind of differentiate those and do peering um, to internal networks at our customers' uh, companies. Um, and then finally, we have Valero, which is going to do backups, and then um, all the kube system e namespaces that you get from the different cloud providers. Cool. So um, kind of transitioning now to the final topic, the final phase, the day two operations. Um, these technologies are kind of the standard ones. Um, and uh, the reason why you pick the standard ones is kind of like the high level concept I want to um, mention, which is that the observability data isn't just for you um, because you are building a system that uh, is kind of customer facing infrastructure. Uh, some of this data you're going to pass on to your customers. They want to know what the um, latencies are of the, da the database. They want to know how much CPU they're using. They want to know um, how much capacity they're using if they're going to have to scale up. Um, if you're going to have to scale up, is that going to affect their bill? Um, so it's not pure, purely your decision on what kind of technologies you're going to choose for, for these stacks because um, they're going to integrate potentially with um, customer systems, um, they might want to ingest logs or traces or metrics from their database as it's running into their own systems so that they can also page their engineers um, if something is going wrong inside of uh, the managed database service. Um, so for that, we're using all the standard um, uh, kind of Prometheus ecosystem um, for observability. So that's kind of the Prometheus operator, Coop state metrics, Thanos, um, Grafana, um, the works there. Um, and then we use Yeager for traces, but generically just open telemetry. Um, and then, uh, as I described before, um, backups need to be not only data, so we're using kind of the box standard cloud provider um, data store backups, so things that come with um, the data store themselves, but we're also building um, APIs so that our customers can basically export data out of uh, live systems or stream that data to a um, replica that they have themselves, um, maybe on a completely different premise, um, on-prem um, or a backup environment. Um, so we're, we're kind of tackling this on both fronts, but the unique thing is actually not the backup of the data, but the fact that you have to also back up the configuration because if you restore the cluster and replay all Plumi and your configuration changes, that's not going to include any of the changes the customers have made to the control plane themselves. Um, so that's where Valero comes in and we're actually continuously backing up the changes that customers are making to the clusters so that if we have to restore a cluster, we can restore absolutely everything. And the kind of nice thing is it's all kind of decoupled in different ways. So we can restore just the customer data if we needed to restore it to a older version of maybe the cluster or an older version of the configuration, all the namespaces that run in the cluster because everything is broken into these three different um, categories. Uh, we can actually mix and match versions to produce stable versions or unstable versions uh, um, of the environments for our users. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to conclude, uh, you can find me on social media in these three places on um, Twitter, Blue Sky, and then you can always email me um, if you're interested in any of the projects I talked about. Um, we have a link to Spice to be dedicated. Um, the open source Spice to be operator is available for um, exploring and kind of like learning how we went about automating the actual operational side of our database. Um, <clears throat> that's actually built on another library that we have open source called Controller Idioms. And what Controller Idioms does is it wraps up high level behavior that you're going to need to implement for um, idiomatic. Uh, custom controllers and Kubernetes operators into a library that you can just reuse. Um, so examples of this are kind of custom informers, um, setting statuses according to other properties um, that of like other resources you're managing, um, things like being able to pause your, op uh, your operator so that the operator stops reconciling so that a human can come in and debug, um, to kind of like these higher level patterns that you would always need to implement that are not like the core logic of uh, the operator. We've kind of abstracted in a way that you can import. Um, and then also, uh, if you're more interested in SpiceDB itself, you can always join the SpiceDB Discord or um, look at our GitHub organization. Um, we have plenty of other open source projects all around the cloud native ecosystem, things uh, regarding 
basically all parts of the stack, operators, gRPC, um, the database itself, um, clients for the database, things like that. So uh, thanks for your time.